This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hello, everyone. This is Joey with the Norris Group. Thank you for joining us. We have a very special show for you today. As you know, on July 1st, 2022, the real estate industry lost an icon, Aaron Norris. Well, today is March 31st, and today would have been Aaron's 46th birthday. So to celebrate Aaron, we put together a show of some of Aaron's old interviews. We wanted to take a walk down memory lane and remember Aaron's dynamic personality, his awesome interview skills, and to look back on some of the fun times that Aaron provided for us. In this first clip, we look back at Aaron's weekly real estate news videos. This one is from November of 2019. Let's get started. Hey everybody, it's Aaron Norris with The Norris Group. It's Wednesday because it's Thanksgiving uh, tomorrow, so we're gonna be closed. But when it comes to predictions for 2020, what are the things that you would like to never see again? That and much more as we cover the biggest headlines in real estate. Up on the radio show and podcast, we have John Aronson, the ADU expert, and there's been a lot of talk because of all the bills that passed in October. So John and I go through all the bills for the next two weeks, what changes, some things that we got excited about, um, and just a general update of the state of accessory dwelling units. You won't want to miss that on the radio show and podcast. New home sales were strong last month, having increased 0.7% to 733,000 units. Home prices increased 3.2% year over year in September, an improvement from August. Housing inventory has been in short supply for the past decade, in large part because builders have struggled to overcome the scarcity and rising costs. Well, Zillow says a flood of homes will come on the market in the next 20 years as the silver tsunami of baby boomers leaving their homes at record levels in the coming years free up tons of inventory. Within two decades, more than a quarter of, a, of currently owner-occupied homes will become available. What's interesting about this is specific states like California, you've got it where owners aren't leaving because they can't afford to move at least in the same state. They have to exit the state. So they have to stay here because Proposition 13 sort of has them locked in. So it's gonna be really interesting to watch this and seniors because of technology, robotics, will they end up staying in their homes with robotics and wearables, allowing them to do more uh, where they currently live? We'll have to wait and see. I don't know if I agree, agree with this prediction by Zillow. In the age of technology, Forbes says it may be time to revive the lost art of door knocking and cold calling. Technology allows us to market a property to thousands and even millions of people in a click of a button, utilize algorithms, and directly target very specific prospects, deploying software that automates a lot of the process. That said, it is important not to underestimate the power of traditional techniques, plus technology can be integrated to make that even more effective. We have a lot of real estate investors that do nothing but things like door knock and uh, cold calling, so there you go. The Federal Housing Finance Agency has raised maximum conforming loan limits for the fourth straight year. This means that mortgage rates that adhere to Fannie and Freddie uh, maximum MIMS will have a new national maximum around 510,000 with a high cost areas at 765,000. Up on the screen, you're gonna see comparison of 2019 and 2020 here in some of the big counties in California. So overall, it's about, about an average of 5% increase here in California, but in some areas that can make a lot of buying power. So stay tuned, 2020 could be exciting. With everyone talking about predictions for the new year, Apartment Therapy gives us eight real home trends that hopefully don't make a comeback in 2020. See if you agree. Let's see, we've got ruffled toilet seat covers, especially when they match your window <laughs> balances. You've got bathroom carpeting. Doesn't even have to be shag. Any carpeting in the bathroom, just say no, unless you really like growing mushrooms inside the house. Plaid overload, a plaid pillow here and there may be good, but maybe leave it off the walls, I don't know. Etched shower doors, just no. Mirrored bathrooms, no, but I don't know, maybe smoke glass? I don't know if I agree with that one. Glass blocks, I know you're, you've been thinking, what if we could use sweet lighting effects and glass blocks? I don't know, this is another one, I don't hate it. It could be cool. And then we've got carpet on the walls. Really folks, I don't think I've ever seen carpet on the walls that would be very extra. I don't even think I've seen a 70s home with carpet on the wall. Personally, I'm really voting for the popcorn ceilings with glitter, y'all. But I'd love to hear what you, trends you would like to see completely go away or never come back in 2020. We'll put you on record. Up next is Aaron's interview with Christy Sertwell. In this clip, you can really hear the joy that Aaron brought to the table. Aaron and Christy talk about ADUs and Christy's journey. 
Hey everybody, it's Aaron Norris over at the Norris Group, and today we are here with longtime real estate investor Christy Sertwell. She started in Toronto, but made her way to Long Beach, California back in 2007, the perfect time to become a full-time real estate investor. <laughs> and since 2008, she's purchased over 250 homes, and her specialty happens to be hoarder homes. So today we're going to talk about everything from ADUs to SB9 to hoarder homes. Um, she currently flips tons of projects. Um, she's doing ADUs, some really interesting things in um, like lot splits and in her spare time she endures outdoor activities playing her guitar and of course good food and wine who doesn't and everybody wants to know do you still have the 1979 volkswagen bus <laughs> good memory yes i do <laughs> <laughs> are you rocking it <laughs> uh, she's she's a lot of work she's a lot of <laughs> work let's just say that <laughs> I can only imagine. Well, let me set the stage with a few things that I think real estate investors should should know. I've been presenting on ADUs now for, I think, three years and then SB9 for the last year. I think there's some really cool opportunity. We're getting close. I think SB9 is going to follow ADU and make it more investor friendly. But the National Association of Home Builders came out and showed that uh, new construction nationwide on an average build of around $400,000 $100,000 almost, 93870 to be exact, goes towards things like government and impact fees, which is crazy. So you wonder why here in California, with the starting price of land, uh, what's a what's a half an acre going for these days in, in LA, Christy? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Who knows? I've seen it anywhere from 400000 upwards. Right. So before you even construct anything, sticks and bricks, you're already looking at, you know, four to 500,000 just in governmental fees and, and land costs, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. So the state has just released within the last year, its new RENA numbers, which stands for regional housing needs allocation. And the one reason that cities and counties might work with you is because they are, they are really adding teeth to these rules that if these cities and jurisdictions do not meet their goals in the next eight years or so, they're going to start taking away specific funding like CDBG funds. So cities are, they've got to figure it out. And I'll give you an example. Orange County has to build 183,000 um, through October, 2029. It's crazy. And the few planning people I know, they're like, it's insane. Like we would have to replicate the best years ever, every year leading up to that. So it's just really, really interesting to see this in the play. And then you can look, uh, if you think the government's doing a good, good job, my favorite go-to is to watch the HHH fund. Um, that got passed in 2016, where the uh, citizens of L LA, you are paying $1.2 billion so the government could supposedly create 10,000 affordable units. And as October of 2021, there was only 1,000 of those available uh, and an average price of $579,000 per unit. <laughs> I love it when Sean, Sean says it's the best. Californians spend more money on unaffordable housing than anywhere else. Yes. <laughs> so imagine if they would have taken that $1.2 billion, given it to investors to do ADUs. How yep. crazy, 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 crazy. Well, let's start at the beginning. When, when you have a conversation with a, a, about an ADU, how do you describe it to the layperson? Well, I guess a better term is just saying a back house. Yeah. Uh, you know, a house in the in the rear of your property that is an additional um, living space for somebody, either an extended family member or, you know, a renter to help you out with the mortgage payment. And and there's also some, something called a junior accessory dwelling unit, which is just a converted garage, right? Pretty much. Yeah. So it has to be converted existing space. So if your garage is attached, generally they'll let you convert that and call it a junior ADU. But when you start getting into junior ADUs, you have to live in one of the units. You have to live on the property. Technically. Yeah. Tec <laughs> She's all technically wink. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I actually talked to a planner uh, of a city last week and he's like, yeah, I mean, you, you should intend the keyword being intend, but there's no way that they have to enforce it. I was going to say, who is enforcing it? Well, I think the place where investors are going to run amok are neighbors. Neighbors are truly freaking out. If you, mm -hmm. let's real quick, because it comes up, um, triplex sizing. <laughs> Can you describe that? Sure. Well, I'll back up. And when I first started building ADUs in 2018, back then you were supposed to live in either the main house or the ADU. Well, I didn't know that rule. And I was building five at the same time. 
And I started getting all these letters halfway through construction saying, well, by the way, you have to sign and notarize and record this document saying you're going to live in one of them. Well, anyway, they did away with that rule. So you can actually be building an ADU on a rental property now and have both units rented. Um, but now, as you know, with SB9, you can technically have up to four units on an R1 zone property. Now, does now, it always make sense to do that? Now, I read the the law and it says that you can split the lot, but the city does not allow have to allow you to build an ADU. So that's going to be very city specific. Have you already talked to certain cities and they're cool with it? Like, yes, yeah, split the lot and build ADUs. We'd love that. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, um, two different planners, um, Long Beach and Lakewood, um, I've talked to both and they're pretty open about it. That's Some great. cities don't really have, I mean, it's just like when ADUs were first passed, the cities are like, what, what is this? <laughs> so you kind of just default to the state. So I'm sure as the, the months go on, each city will develop their own plans uh, or, or, you know, s- set of rules. But as of right now, most of them are just defaulting to what state put in place, which is technically, it doesn't matter what size the, I mean, there's some discretion you have to use there, but you can technically split a lot or you don't even need to split it. You can have main house, then what they're calling a second unit, a second house, mm-hmm. and then ADU, and then JDU. So that's oh, four I see units. Saying. Yeah, that's okay. Four I see units on, on one, one single, it has to be zoned R1 to do that. Interesting. So if you could technically, if they got really fancy, you could do a lot split and do th- three units on each property if it would fit if it yeah that that you know cram lord the idea of you know design being really important you don't want to create a piece of junk that people yeah. don't want to live in or where it takes an hour to park i mean i i think investors we really have to learn to play nice and we're going to be our own worst enemy when it comes to this i think cities and counties are going to want to work with us i've been on housing commissions of not what not having the conversation about you're never going to do this on your own. You need investors to come to the table because right now SB9 was really written with the homeowner in mind, but how many homeowners can stomach the construction process in today's market? One of Aaron's favorite things to do was researching things for Main Street investors. And there was nothing that Aaron loved better than going to trade shows and getting the inside scoop for all of you. Here's Aaron and Rose Quint from the National Association of Home Builders talking about the things that builders were putting into homes. Yeah. Let's let's get into your presentation because we, it covers three different. Um, it covers data from the census, um, the NH, uh, the National Association of Home Builder Builder Survey, and then the preference survey is really aimed more at the consumer what they're wanting, which is always interesting to, to me because it doesn't always translate to what's actually being built. <laughs> so it, it's sort of forward looking of what they're wanting and probably will end up on the desk of the builders. But let's start at the U.S. Census. It was really interesting to see that home size once again is up year over year. And the last time we've seen these sizes of homes was before the downturn. So is this a predictor of we're going to have a downturn? Homes are getting McMansion sized or what's going on? (laughs) No, builders are adjusting. Builders are doing what they do. They're adjusting to the demands of the marketplace. They're adjusting to the demands of their buyers. So if I can take you back to after the Great Recession, so 08 or 09, uh, the size and the amenities in homes, um, you know, they sank real low after the Great, the great Recession. Uh, and then for a number of years, the homes got bigger, roughly between 2010 and 2015. The homes got bigger. They got, they, it was more likely that they came with four or more bedrooms or three or more full bathrooms. Um, and that was during the period of time when underwriting was really tight. Do you remember those days? Mm-hmm. It was really tight. And then only people that had super fantastic, fabulous, um, credit history and employment history could even get a loan. Um, and so the houses that got built during the, that period reflected the type of buyers that were standing in the game. Yep. Uh, that sort of peaked in 2015. And then underwriting, underwriting became a lot more reasonable for some home buyers re enter the market, younger buyers re enter the market. And for a number of years, from like 2016 to 2020, we saw all those trends reverse. And the average size began to come down. It was less likely that they had, you know, giant number of bedrooms or bathrooms or um, a garage for three cars or more. Those characteristics declined for a period of about four or five years. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, then 2020 came. COVID arrived in all of our lives. 
the world ended as we knew it and builders had to adapt quickly to the demands of their marketplace. And yeah, so- home, home is now where we live, work, play, educate. <laughs> it, yeah. It, yeah. I, it, I mean, our, COVID our, changed everything, how we exercise, how we work, how we study, how we pray, how we socialize, everything. Everything was changed and um, how we exercise, definitely. And so, so it, yes, yeah, so there is now a new pivot point uh, that we see it in the data from the Census Bureau from 2021, um, where we see, again, size rising again. So it bottomed out um, in 2020. We see the average size of new homes in 21 rising to uh, a little over 2,500 square feet mm-hmm. again. And also, you know, the share of new homes with all those amenities, four or more uh, bedrooms, three plus full bathrooms, all those things rising again. Um, again, why? Because builders are responding. They're, they're adapting and they're responding to the preferences brought about by COVID-19. Uh, in very general terms, what are those? People want more square footage for the reasons you just mentioned, right, Aaron? Mm-hmm. We want to do the home. It, we just need to function differently in the home. We want more out of the home. Yeah, it was interesting to see uh, the patio has consistently been rising since the bench, uh, 2010. So I'm ass- assuming um, when they say patio, that means outdoor living space in the backyard or does it matter? It could be on the side of the house too. Okay. Uh, yeah, it could be on the side of the house. It just has to have a, a concrete or you know a solid surface um, outside of the house. And uh, it's been rising for over a decade. Yeah, so, yeah. so this desirability for a patio is not new. Very uh, cool. So, COVID did not come in and invent uh, the popularity of patios, but it certainly accelerated it (laughs) more. Uh, Because, and I'll tell you why, um, buyers now more than ever really, really, really want to spend time outdoors in the safety and the privacy of their own homes. And a patio is just perfect to do that. No, I totally understand. So it's really great that the I, I, you know, I didn't know until I started looking at your report that the U.S. Census was the uh, ones collecting that data as well. I thought it was the NAHB. So it is good. We've got some history on it. So it's very interesting to follow. So good. Okay. We've yeah. got more we space. We analyzed it though. The what? We analyzed it though. All right. Well, <laughs> Let's jump into the builder survey. This is work that you guys have actually done. And can we talk about how many people take this and uh, what the goal of this survey is? So, yes. So we keep, um, and your your listeners may have heard of this, um, NHB conducts a monthly survey of single family builders across the country called the Housing Market Index. Um, The NHB Wells Fargo Housing Market Index to be completely correct. Um, And and that survey produces... uh, what's the best indicator of the housing market in available out there called the HMI, um, in which builders tell us how they feel, how their sentiment about new home sales. Um, and that number has a very good correlation with housing starts. So it's a very popular number among analysts and government regulators, uh, et cetera. But anyway, in that same survey every month, we include a set of questions that deal with something that's very a very hot topic for the industry, something that we really need an answer for that only we have access to builders and therefore can find it. And so a lot of, um, a lot of people try to turn to us who are interested in finding out um, information about the home building industry. And we do it uh, for certain purposes sometimes that deal with research that I present at IBS. So for example, Late every year, I ask builders across the country about the features they're, the feature they're most likely to include in the typical home they build that, that next year, that year starting. And so we, <clears throat> excuse me, we did that for 2022. And um, I have a list, the most likely features that builders will include. And that's the, that's the operative word here. They will include it in the typical home they build. So these are not options. These are things that they will include in the typical home they build this year. We give them a scale, one not, not likely that I will include it, five very likely. So the highest, the higher the average rating, the more likely. So at the very top, you have a walk-in closet in the primary bedroom, for example. Very, you can almost be guaranteed sure that that's happening in the typical home this year. Uh, similarly, a laundry room, very, very likely. And a great room. Those are the top three most likely features coming to the typical home this year. How do you like those? 
I, I was really surprised to see very high up on the list this year. It seemed like more energy efficiency, wh whether it was Windows or Energy Star appliances, more automation, um, low water things. A lot of different efficiency things made the list. Are, are buyers really caring about that? Yes, yes. So builders um, understand that the typical buyer is looking for a house that is green and green in a sense. And, and for buyers, let me let me explain that for buyers, that means an energy efficient home. That's what green means to home buyers. It's an energy efficient home. And so they will include in from this survey, we know that the typical home in 2022 will have low E windows, for example, and it will have energy star windows and energy star appliances. And it will use efficient lighting. Those are bulbs that use less energy than your traditional bulbs. So yes, and water conserving toilets, as you mentioned. Um, so yes, um, the builders, again, are reacting to the demands of their buyers. In our final clip, we feature the first radio show that we ever did after Bruce had moved to Florida. Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and today our special guest is Aaron Norris. Howdy. Aaron is, <laughs> there he is. Aaron, how you doing? I'm good, and this is the very first show that we are taping with you in Florida. Well, how That's right. I, I, am, I am sitting in what will be my office, surrounded by boxes that have not yet been unpacked. So it's definitely, it's definitely new uh, feeling, but I, I'm, I'm actually really excited to be here. Um, Alex Serrato is the builder that you know I've used in California for many years, and he's building homes very successfully here. We've got something like 20-some going on, and most of the homes, when they're done, are pending in a day. So I'm excited about what we've got going on here. So they stepped in and painted the, painted the home that we moved into, and so now if we, all we have to do is get get these boxes put away and feel like it's, uh, feel like it's home. <laughs> you know, you've been talking about moving to Florida forever. I think it was one of those moments where we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He is always saying he's moving to Florida. And then July, you guys said, we're moving. You went to Florida. You very typical to dad fashion. He puts a home in escrow <laughs> while he's there. And then within a month he's gone. It's, it was the craziest thing I ever saw. Let's let's cover the power of goals. I think you taught me the power of goals at a very young age, and I just shined it on. I think you. I remember you giving me a book while I was in New York City, and I'm like, Dad, I'm gonna be a Broadway guy. I don't, I don't need this goal stuff. I'm a star, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and uh, was funny as I wrote down. Uh, I I use something called the Full Focus Planner. I've been using it for years, and it's completely changed my life. I had no idea. I was so obsessed with checking things off. It's in magical. But one of the goals was that I was going to start a third hustle. So the Norris Group, my rentals, and then I wanted a challenge. I wanted something just on the side. So, so Herbalife, Herbalife was out of the question. Herbalife was out of the question, correct. <laughs> no Cutco knives. I, yeah, that's not my scene. That's going to do it for the show. Thank you for taking this bittersweet trip down memory lane with us. Happy birthday, my brother. Happy heavenly birthday, Aaron Norris. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911. Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.